So there's three types of false confessions. There's a voluntary false confession, where this is offered willingly. A lot of times people do this. It'll be like a highly publicized crime, and the police will get like 15 people that will confess to committing this crime. Usually they have some degree of mental illness, uh, or they're seeking publicity or something like that. I think that happened in the... There's coerced compliant confessions. So to escape further interrogation, gained a promised benefit, or avoid a threatened punishment. Like, look, if you just confess to this crime, we're not going to go after your family. But if you don't confess to this, we're going to take your whole family down. Or we're going to seek the death penalty. And then coerced, internalized confessions. These are innocent suspects that confess and actually come to believe that they are, in fact, guilty. Think about Joe from that other video. So the goal of an interrogation is generating confessions. That's the goal. But we also have the goal of just getting more information about the case. A lot of officers go into an interrogation with only the goal of generating a confession. Their job is to induce the suspect to confess. But why not just go in to elicit more information about the case? If you've already made up your mind that the suspect is guilty, you're going to be viewing the information with like blinders on, seeing things very specifically. So what can police do and what can they not do? So they can use manipulative tactics. A lot of people don't know this. They can minimize the seriousness of the crime, or they could maximize the seriousness of the crime. They can lie about stuff that they know. They can use baiting questions. They can use rapport building techniques, like Mutt and Jeff, or good cop, bad cop. You've seen that. So one cop will go in and try and be like aggressive, and then another cop will come in and try and bond with the person that they're interrogating with. These are all manipulative tactics. Police are permitted to misrepresent the facts of the case. So they can go in and say, hey, your buddy in the other room right next door, he just confessed. He said that you were the one that pulled the trigger. And if you're sitting in a confession room, or an interrogation room, that's, that's kind of a funny slip of the tongue there. Um, what would you do? You just found out that your friend said that you committed a crime and which you didn't commit. You can use techniques that take advantage of uh, emotions or beliefs of the suspects. So a lot of times police officers will play like a religious card, like, you know, Jesus will forgive you if you just admit to your sins. Fail to inform the suspect of some important facts that might make the suspect less likely to confess. Stuff like that. So what are they not allowed to do? Now, even though they're not permitted to do these things, I mean, I have a lot of students that have been interrogated, and the line between what constitutes prolonged isolation is probably different in different departments. But they, they're not permitted to use physical force, abuse, or torture. They're not supposed to threaten harm or punishment. They're not supposed to keep suspects isolated for prolonged periods of time. They're not supposed to deprive them of food or sleep. They're not supposed to promise leniency. Um, they have to notify suspects of their Miranda rights, although some people advocating getting rid of, rid of Miranda rights altogether. And there's certain types of psychological tricks that they're not supposed to do. Do those things actually happen? Yeah, in my opinion, they probably do. So, in 1986, Colorado v. Conley, a suspect's mental limitations or psychological problems alone are not sufficient for concluding that a confession 
was involuntary. So as a consultant or an employee of a police department, as a psychologist, you might seek to educate the detectives about um, what might happen or some of the mental limitations that someone has or psychological problems and how that might affect a confession. So, if we look at coercion and we look at some famous cases, it's pretty interesting. Brown v. Mississippi is the one I like the best. And Brown v. Mississippi, this case involved three black defendants who had been convicted of the murder of a white man entirely based on confessions. But the confessions were um, after one of them had been severely whipped and literally hung twice from a tree. The other two had been stripped naked and beaten until they signed a confession that the police had actually written for them. The Supreme Court reversed these convictions on the grounds that the police had violated the defendant's rights to due process of law. The court ruled that evidence procured through torture must be excluded from trials. But what emerged after the Brown case was a distinction between coerced and voluntary confessions. What constituted coercion, though, really wasn't quite clear as um, the courts recognized that sheer physical brutality was not the only means of coercion. The, that was also part of the Bram case. Now, in Davis uh, v. North Carolina, police held Davis without uh, having contact with anyone else, isolated in an incarceration for 16 days. He wasn't allowed visitors or phone calls, and police found that his coercion, initially, the courts found that his coercion was voluntary. Ashcraft, up here, Ashcraft v. Tennessee. This was a, uh, a gentleman that was continuously questioned for 36 hours straight without sleep. There's another case, uh, it's not on the screen there, uh, a guy named Michael uh, Pardue that was 17 years old who confessed to three murders that occurred in a small Alabama town in 1973. After he was convicted, he claimed that a detective known for beating confessions out of suspects had interrogated him nonstop for more than 78 hours and had scared him into confessing. 20 years later, the Alabama Supreme Court agreed that his confession had been coerced. But, uh, Pardue will never get out of jail because under the three strikes law he tried to escape from custody three times which uh, then became a mandatory life sentence even though he should have never been in prison to begin with. In general judges rarely conclude that police trickery was so severe that it undermined voluntary uh, the, the voluntariness of the confession. I don't want to talk about those. So, when we look at the voluntariness of a confession, this should be determined by the totality of the circumstances, a preponderance of evidence standard, not just based on the fact that the individual confessed. And oftentimes we uh, need to consider the fundamental attribution error. And what that is, is accepting on face value a person's disposition, their attributes, whatever it might be, 
without taking into account the totality of all the environmental or situational factors. So you might say, you might be listening to this, and you might say, well, how could somebody confess? Da 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 da. I would never confess to committing a crime, blah, blah, blah. But you've never been held in solitary confinement without making phone calls or having any visitors for 16 days at a time. If you look at a confession in light of the situational factors, uh, things might change a little bit. And there's something else. Uh, a lot of students talk to me about this. Um, Fortunately, a lot of students have uh, been interrogated by police for various things. But what do you think the broader implications of police officers lying to suspects are? What are the broader effects? Because they're allowed to lie to suspects. And it's a pretty good way to get somebody to confess to a crime. It's a tactic that's often used. I'm not sure if I like that though. Let's say you were innocent and you did not confess to the crime. When you leave that interrogation session, what do you think your feelings are gonna be like in regards to the police officers? They don't have to tell you afterwards, oh, we were just lying about that, we were trying to get you to confess. You just go home. So think of those broader implications there. And the way that we do confessions in this country is not the only way. So if you're interested in this, uh, look up the procedures for interrogation in this country versus Europe. Um, if you're a criminal justice major, this might be an interesting paper that you could write on someday. So that's it for this one. Um, what I really like about this chapter is the video that you had to watch. So if you didn't watch it, make sure you do. Um, and focus on the material that I covered in this lecture.